My dad went to the university, so my dad says oh, I was a bit like when I went to university, he said, because my dad went to university in York, in England, and he, uh, to use the English parlance, uh, read mathematics and English, and, and back then an unusual kind of combination. And in O week, orientation week, that sort of first week of university where we do things that we never ever do again in our lives, uh, he went to all male college, and the tradition was uh, on the third day of orientation week, all these young men would come down into the foyer of the college, take all their clothes off, naked, run through the city of York, and then jump into the, the river that goes through the, the main river of York. And so, you know, my father did this, and he tells a story about they all get out of the, all these young men get out of the river and are standing on the bank, and around the corner comes a punt, and on this boat is a whole bunch of women. And my father does this. Now, the guy next to him is a philosophy student who does this and says, I don't know about you, James, but around here I'm known by my face. <laughs> and in the spirit of curiosity, which you've heard a lot about, and the spirit of what are you wondering, what have you wondered about today, I mean, that's how my dad describes what I do, is I give people ways of thinking where to put your conversational hands, to not just do the automatic, to think what that is. So I'd like to talk to you about, about conversations, because this 13 and a half to 14 years of energy and effort over the last couple of days comes to naught unless it causes a conversation outside of this room. And I, so, so I begin by asking you, what conversation is it time for now? What conversations are you going to have when you go back? And I don't go, say, back to work, because you've been at work for two and a half days. The notion that somehow learning is an adjunct to work is a complete nonsense. You have been working profoundly and hard, and I admire you for that. I'd like to put up a, um, a quick phrase, and I want you just to kind of chat to the person next to you for, for like 30 seconds. Does that make sense to you? And if it does make sense to you, in your workplaces, what do you figure are the most significant things that shift culture? So one, does it resonate? And two, what do you reckon are the top half a dozen things that shift culture? You've got 30 seconds. Just say good day to the person next to you. Does it make sense? What do you think? Does it make sense? All right. I'm going to, since it's very difficult to have a Q&A when we've only got 40 minutes together, I'm going to assume that I, to use phrasing, I have asked you a question and I'm already assuming you, that I've got the answer. Huh. Most of us would say yes. And you can think about that. It doesn't matter. You can have the best strategy, the best policies on the planet. But if the culture doesn't work, if it's toxic or scary or whatever else it is, it doesn't matter how good the strategy is, it ain't going to happen. Equally, ordinary, good enough strategy and policies, etc., and a great culture, then, then things start to happen. And I think that works at an organisation level. And clearly, you know, on the basis of, of Helen's work this morning, it, it, at all sorts of levels. And the top half a dozen, the answer is it's you. You can see on there that organisation policies, organisation structures actually are way down the list. The thing that's at the very top of the list is how you have conversations, how you show up moment by moment. And I use the word leader to mean somebody who cares enough to want to make a difference. That to me is a kind of relatively simple way of thinking about a leader. So that's what I'm about and that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, I want to know about how you be, not what you do. Doing is the early part of change. Being is the really significant part of change. How are you? How do you be? And, and the question that's confronting is, how does the room change when you enter it? Whether there are kids in that room, whether there are parents, whether there are friends, whether there are colleagues. And I'm talking about the first nanosecond. The look on your face. What do you cause? I used to work for a guy who, I have to say, the moment he worked in the, walked in the room, we would look and go, what mood is he in right now? Because we knew that depending on that, whether we'd be fearful or excited and that kind of stuff. Leaders are mindful. People who are actually influential know that the moment, the nanosecond they show up, they have an impact. The nanosecond. 
So do you breathe or pause before you go in a room or before you have a meeting or before you have a conversation? What is the mood that I want this, this conversation to be in? Way before language. You know, one of the things that we, we learnt when we did play school was that we would, we would get actors to come and, come and audition. We'd have a couple of kids playing down here in the sandpit. Those kids responded in the first nanosecond when those people walked in the room. We could virtually tell who would make it and who wouldn't in that nanosecond. And, and that's the reality of human beings. So if conversations matter that much, then what do we know about conversations? Well, the first thing is kind of stuff that's obvious, really, and I just want to go quickly here. All human beings have things that they deeply care about, things that matter to them. And, and this morning, for those of you who went to the workshop that didn't follow this, that was supposed to follow this, but went first, <laughs> which is fine, I talked about who-ness and what-ness. And again, it mirrors much of what we've heard about in the last couple of days. Who I am is Colin. And Colin's got kind of passions and delights and fears and all those kind of things. And what I am is a consultant. I'm a director of some companies. I do a whole bunch of other things and I still do occasional broadcasting. If you really want to connect with me, you've got to connect with Colin. Not this bunch of accountabilities. If you think about this in kind of simple terms, if you think that the liberation of cleverness, creativity, the capacity to deal with ambiguity, does it come from my bunch of accountabilities, what I am or who I am? Yeah. And so the first challenge is, do you actually think about that? When you're about to talk to somebody, have a conversation, when you think about talking to somebody on Monday or tomorrow, whenever else it is, are you thinking about what they deeply care about, what they care about, not what you care about? Do you think about what their fears might be right now? What do they deeply and passionately care about? Can you find something that they care about and you care about without debate? to start the conversation. So start with what's present, not what's not present. And, and that's, that's the essence of conversations. Let me give you an example, and I kind of, I'm, I guess I'm kind of rushing to this. I uh, had the extraordinary privilege to um, work with Nelson Mandela, and I don't say that to, to big note in the slightest. It was profoundly humbling and quite frankly, really scary. And uh, I was uh, overseas with another colleague and we were doing stuff for UNICEF, um, another thing you may not know about, I mean, we used to build um, television radio stations to broadcast children's radio and television stuff around the planet. Anyway, we got this, television, this telephone call and this person said to us, um, Mr Mandela would like to talk to you. Well, I'm an Aussie. I've got fabulous bullshit detectors, yeah? <laughs> and I thought, oh, it's bullshit. I'm a little boy from Hobart. I mean, Mandela, Hobart, forget it. And my Dutch colleague went, no, it might be. It just might be. You need to just be careful. Oh, all right. And it turned out it was. And we got invited to go to Johannesburg. And we got to meet uh, the, the extraordinary Nelson Mandela. And he said, I want to run a conference, he said, where we really look at the whole issue of the health and well-being of young children. It's really the, you know, the future of our planet, let alone a particular country. Whoa. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, now I lost my place. Oh, and he said, I, I want to run a conference without speeches. He said, because I don't want to have insight, which is what we've been about. And he said, I just need people to start to talk to each other. He said, I want to bring together the five southernmost African countries. He said, and I, what I want, he said, is I want them to think about how they can collaborate more. He said, it might look like that one country takes on the research and, and, and ideation and setting of ideas around, around uh, maternal kind of health. Another, one, another country takes on um, infant mortality. Another one takes on girl nutrition, et cetera. So we get really focused and then we share. So that's the kind of idea I have. Well, I can tell you now, we went like, holy crap, didn't say it in front of him, of course. Um, but that's, you think about that. One country to get bureaucrats and politicians, and in those places you've got the military in the room, and parents and doctors to talk to each other in one country, let alone across five countries. And in Africa, of course, you've got the whole kind of, the overlay of all the, all the tribes. And um, so we worked today. He said, he said, I've thought about that. He said, you have to begin, as you would understand, with a deep and profound moral purpose. He said, we're going to call this conference not how to create cross-collaboration across, you know, southern African countries. We're going to simply call it a future for our children. You can hear already that takes it away from the whatness into the who-ness. So we went, okay. So we, we run this uh, three and a half day search conference. We had uh, 
600 people and uh, it was grabbing a tiger by the tail. And the first half day went great and we got a whole lot of histories up and we honoured people's past and we honoured the cleverness that was already there and all that kind of stuff. And then the, the second day it just began to grind. People began to keep talking about why it wouldn't work, why it wouldn't work.